Since September the 11th, America has seemed locked into its war on terror. One might believe that American diplomatic horizons stop at the suburbs of Baghdad or Kabul. But while focusing on the vestiges of the World Trade Center, the country is secretly preparing for a new conflict, an undeclared war, but one that is the top priority for the intelligence community and the White House. Ahead of Al-Qaeda, more important than the quagmire in Iraq, the Chinese threat, America's new war. They have a term they call comprehensive national power, which is economic, political, military, all together, cultural. And they say this is the essence of China. This is the time for China to rise. Our time has come. This is the Tang Dynasty again. We are a great power. We are a world power. They are playing the old Sunza game, winning the fight without firing a bullet, or that isn't what Sunza said, but win the battle without losing men. That's the best way of winning. And I think this is, they're very conscious of this, but they're willing to fight. The world will, uh, how to say, run by three first-class countries. One is USA, United States of America. Another is USE, United States of Europe. Then the Greater China. Um, at this point, at the current uh, point, I think um, the possibility to see a USE is very <laughs> slim. Um, but the USA stay as top one country is something sure, right? And as for the possibility of Greater China, the possibility is something in between. Right? So I tend to think uh, Sino-US relations will be one of the most important bilateral ties uh, in the coming years. And this bilateral tie will decide the nature of international relations in 21st century. If this bilateral tie is confrontation oriented, then the whole 21st century will be bound by confrontation. Kinmen Island, the actual frontier between the two giants, and where the ultimate confrontation may take place. This little island belongs to Taiwan, but it is only two kilometers from the Chinese coast. From here, one can see the inaccessible banks of Fujian province, where hundreds of ballistic missiles point at Taipei. Twenty-four hours a day, for 60 years, Taiwan has been watching communist China. This island, regularly threatened by Beijing, has been bombarded thousands of times. It has never surrendered. America has sent a message to Beijing. The fall of Kinmen would lead to a direct confrontation. We're in the Strait of Taiwan. It's here that a military clash might one day break out. Taiwan is one of those emotional hot-button issues, the way Jerusalem is to Palestinians and Israelis, the way Kosovo was to the Albanians and Serbs. And for most mainland Chinese, Taiwan is rightfully a Chinese province. This was territory that they believe was stolen from China by Japan in the 1895 war, and that the United States prevented reunification during the early stages of the Cold War because of our opposition to communism. In 1996, here in the Straits of Taiwan, China and America engaged in their biggest military standoff. 
The ongoing elections in Taiwan annoyed the regime in Beijing. So the Chinese army decided to launch huge military maneuvers to test the Americans' reaction. After several days of this Chinese show of force, Washington deployed two aircraft carriers. It was the first time the two countries came face to face. For several days, there was extreme tension between the two nuclear powers. When the Chinese fired short-range ballistic nuclear-capable missiles off the north and south coast of Taiwan, and carried out a major, what we call a live fire exercise, and Jiang Zemin was there, the president. They were using some very belligerent language. This is when we dispatched two carrier battle groups off the East Coast. And this was a show, this, this was force. And uh, the matter quickly dissipated. The Chinese thought this was excessive. They thought that they had an understanding with the US, that they would have a limited display to show their seriousness on the issue. The U.S. would adopt a very limited response, and then they would both back away. They regarded the deployment of a second carrier as excessive and in some ways as humiliating to the Chinese because the Chinese couldn't do much to deter or complicate the deployment of those carriers. I know this story well, and I can tell you that the truth is very different from the American propaganda. I was there in 1996. The Americans had promised to send an aircraft carrier to Taiwan for Election Day to protect Taiwan. But actually, the only American ship near Taiwan was the electronic spy ship Bunker Hill. And it was more than 200 nautical miles away. And the first American aircraft carrier was 600 nautical miles from Taiwan. So the truth is that the Americans announced that they were coming, but they kept their distance. They wanted at all costs to avoid any incident, and they didn't dare approach our army. Even if the Americans didn't take much of a risk, in the eyes of the world, they reaffirmed a sacred principle of their foreign policy. They support Taiwan. And they will continue to do so regardless of China's growing power. I think believes Taiwan is very important for a number of reasons, uh, not to mention the fact that it's our eighth largest trading partner, our sixth largest market for agricultural goods. It's one of America's uh, most important sources of high-tech semiconductor products. Even though they're imported to the United States via China, they're made in uh, Taiwan. But that, of course, isn't the only thing. The, the real reason I think America has a commitment to Taiwan is because Taiwan is a democracy. It is, in fact, the most vibrant and dynamic democracy in East Asia. And it's a democracy that, that came to fruition under the pressure of the US government, primarily the Congress, um, after 40 years of uh, very tight authoritarian rule by uh, a regime that came from mainland China. I think, however, the real reason that the United States especially the Pentagon is so concerned about Taiwan, is that it has been a very strong defense and intelligence partner for the last 50 years, including the last uh, 30 years since uh, the breaking of relations with the Republic of China and Taiwan. We have still maintained a very strong defense relationship and a very strong intelligence collection relationship with Taiwan. I would say the United States is committed to Taiwan. This goes back historically a long, long way. World War II, we were there. And uh, we were looking for a strong, unified, democratic China. Well, we got two thirds of it, strong and unified, not democratic. 
Now we're calling China a responsible stakeholder. We've got half of it. We've got a stakeholder, but not a responsible one yet. The U.S. feels that we have an obligation, legal, moral, to Taiwan, that we cannot stand idly by and let this be taken over by what looks like an authoritarian, communist-influenced power. This cannot be. Taiwan, an island of 23 million inhabitants, 250 kilometers from the Chinese coast, is today the most explosive strategic issue between China and the United States. Taipei, the capital, flaunts its economic success. It is one of the biggest centers in the world for the electronics industry. A modern city, free, young, and always noisy. In 1895, Taiwan was invaded by Japan. Fifty years later, after the Japanese defeat, peace treaties returned the territory to China, a China which was then in the midst of a civil war between Mao's communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. When the battle turned in Mao's favor, General Chiang Kai-shek, aided by the Americans, took refuge in Taiwan with his soldiers. Since then, two Chinese governments have coexisted. In Beijing, the communist regime that controls the entire mainland. And in Taipei, the nationalist regime, having become little by little a democracy, calling itself the Republic of China, which rules only Taiwan. Officially, these two governments both claim to be the legitimate representatives of all the Chinese. Taiwan is not recognized as a state by the UN, only 20 small countries maintain diplomatic relations with the island, a fragile independence, while Beijing still considers Taiwan as the 23rd province of the People's Republic, a rebel province that the regime intends to reunite with the motherland. I would say two major motivations. There are many others, but two major ones. The first one is national pride, unification of China. They are committed to this. This is, this is a strong emotional drive in China. And, and you don't downplay it. It's real. It's powerful. The second is strategic. They know through history, if Taiwan is un, in unfriendly hands, that China is very badly affected. If you turn the globe around, and if you were the Navy commander of the Chinese armed forces, then you will see the only way to protect my coastline is to extend our defense and power projection capability far away from our territory. Why I need to do that? Because the economic center, financial center, education center, production center of today's China is all on the coastline. So my, the Navy's mission is to make sure that nobody touched this so I can continue to grow. To go out, you have a big stone right there. You can go other places, but there is a stopper, a stone blocking your way, and that's Taiwan. Now, Taiwan depends on the outcome of elections that could change its executive power and stock market risks that can endanger its economy. Beijing, nevertheless, has understood that whatever the mood on the island, especially when it is favorable to political reconciliation, the strategy must never change. Imperturbable, the communist regime continues. On one hand, to offer Taiwan favorable business privileges on the mainland. On the other hand, it regularly reiterates its military threats. 
If the Taiwanese are too insistent about their desire for independence, they're going to have to fight for it. Whatever Taiwan's political tendencies, Beijing's position doesn't change one iota. A freeway in the middle of the island of Taiwan. In a few minutes, it has been transformed into a landing strip. The population watches this military exercise. They're used to it. French Mirage 2000 and American F-16 jets land and take off with an enormous roar. Faced with the uncertainty of American support, Taiwan organizes its own defense. Everyone knows that the airports will be the first target. Strategists on both sides of the strait affirm that the war will first begin with an air battle. I think the experts the world over know that it's very difficult to succeed with an invasion. We still remember Normandy. In a strait like ours, it's what's in the air that will make the difference. And we've always tried to keep a strategic advantage over China, our air superiority. But with the Chinese missiles, this equilibrium has been put into question. They can destroy our airports. And if they are destroyed, we lose our only advantage over China, our air superiority. Taiwan's military power is concentrated in its air force, but also in special ground forces. They are training to face the Chinese People's Liberation Army. In the event of a conflict, they expect elite Chinese troops to parachute onto the island to attack strategic targets. Every Taiwanese people here knows that when the war comes, Taiwan is going to take the first bullet. We are going to take the first bullet, and probably we're going to take the, the bullets continue for about two weeks until a month, until that the United States uh, coming. And there is no way that U.S. Is come, will come here to fight a difficult fight. If, if they really want to get involved, it's better for them that to wait when the Taiwanese people, we are wearing down the Chinese elite troops and uh, give them the huge, uh, give them the huge uh, number of the uh, uh, sacrifice. And then the U.S. can come in and clean out the battlefield and win an easy fight. Everybody in Taiwan knows that. In Washington, the scenario of the next confrontation is a constant preoccupation. They know that Chinese military power has increased significantly. But how the Pentagon will react in case of a new Taiwan crisis remains a mystery. It's certainly not automatic, uh, the support for Taiwan. It never has been. Uh, the United States has always maintained a policy of so-called strategic ambiguity. Uh, in which uh, neither Beijing nor Taiwan can know clearly what the U.S. response might be under any given set of circumstances. Uh, I think that uh, 10 years later from 1996, the missile crisis in the Taiwan Strait, to 2007, uh, we would approach the, the Taiwan issue with a, a little bit more caution. No, I... We would approach the Taiwan issue with a lot more caution. Um, what this means, I think, is that we would be uh, probably resupplying Taiwan by air. Uh, we probably would put a uh, uh, active duty military contingent on Taiwan on, rather than risk putting our ships uh, in, in harm's way. Coming away from this crisis, the U.S. has concluded that the I think there's been problems in what they've concluded. The U.S. has concluded that the Chinese were somewhat intimidated by the, Chi by the U.S. deployments and that, in fact, they now know the U.S. is very determined to use force, if necessary, to ensure peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. In fact, however, I don't think the Chinese were all that intimidated by the deployment of the carriers. What they were is they, it strengthened their resolve 
to acquire capabilities so that they won't be intimidated in the future. Since the 1996 uh, confrontation between China and the United States around the Taiwan issue, I think China's military modernization speed up. And we saw, people saw uh, some uh, achievements, right? Now China owns J-10. That's the typical sixth, third generation uh, fire, uh, fighter. And uh, that made China is the, the third country that can independently produce the third generation firefighter. I, I think that's a strong signal to the US side uh, what uh, achievement uh, on military modernization uh, on PLA side. If China's own terminal uh, objective is trying to so-called unify Taiwan by using force to take over, I think uh, their military capability is good enough. But, but I don't see that, because they're increasing their military budget over the last decade, almost every year, two digits. And their um, budget is not transparent. Some observers uh, calculated, they said, well, in fact, the real number could be triple or double the uh, current budget that they made it public. So why are they are doing it? They, are, they even, for instance now, they even try to show off they have the capability to destroy the uh, satellite the, uh, circling around in the space. Why they did it? Because they want to show to the rest of the world that we are capable of one day becoming a superpower, maybe overtaking the United States. Frankly speaking, uh, the status quo uh, balance of power uh, is still strongly in favor uh, of the United States. But uh, the situation of balance of power is on the change. And I think time is on China's side. Since the 1996 crisis, the United States and China have often had occasion to test each other's resolve. Small conflicts, sometimes public, sometimes secret, that can be understood today as a pattern of confrontations between the two powers. On May 7, 1999, in the midst of the Kosovo War, NATO bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade three Chinese people were killed. NATO claimed it was a military error. CIA had apparently furnished the wrong maps. In answer to this provocation, the Chinese organized mass demonstrations in front of American embassies. Less than two years later, China had its revenge. The 1st of April, 2001, an EP-3 took off from its base in Japan. 
It's a spy plane that flies regular electronic surveillance missions along the Chinese coast. After six hours of flight, while still in international airspace, the American airplane was intercepted by three Chinese jets. This had been going on for some months. The Chinese planes came within a few meters of the American plane, a little game that the pilots were used to. One of the Chinese pilots was Wang Wei, and the crew of the EP-3 knew him well. He had already shown through his past interceptions of US aircraft that he was willing to take some very serious risks in coming very, very close to US aircraft. They knew him well. Smart Alec, hot dog we call him. He's in the thing and screw you, and Sam, he comes up like this. Well, he comes a little bit too close. And the Chinese, again, the propaganda apparatus turns on and they say, our plane deliberately turned, hit his plane and it crashed. Your fault. And we said to China, that defies the laws of physics. The US government had already expressed its concern over this to the Chinese government. I think in this instance, he miscalculated and he al allowed his aircraft to get too close and it struck the US aircraft and it damaged his aircraft in a way that forced him to crash. The Chinese jet plunged into the sea. Its pilot was declared missing. The EP-3 was seriously damaged. It was forced to make an emergency landing, but the closest airstrip was a Chinese military airbase. The airplane succeeded in landing there, but it was now in Hainan, and the crew was immediately taken prisoner. Our air crew is immune to PRC jurisdiction. For the next 10 days, China and the US would perform a diplomatic ballet, each accusing the other of responsibility for the accident. Beijing refused to liberate the crew. This bought time for their military experts to inspect and dismantle the American airplane, which was jam-packed with secret defense equipment. Oh, they got the equipment from the plane and they studied it and took all these things from it. Yeah, they got something, but I mean, it's no big deal. Finally, 10 days later, a letter from the US ambassador apologized for the death of the Chinese pilot, and the crew was freed. What was left of the EP-3 was loaded onto a huge Antonov transport plane. Direction, the United States. The People's Liberation Army did the same thing after each small battle. They analyzed all American techniques and strategies. It was almost an obsession with Beijing. Chinese military development was entirely oriented towards a confrontation with the US. In 1996, China understood that aircraft carriers were the main threat, so they tried to develop arms to counter them. There are several things that the Chinese have done over the last several years that play to this capability. One of them is they have developed a larger number of more sophisticated submarines, diesel submarines. Uh, and contrary to what a lot of people think, many diesel submarines are quieter than many nuclear submarines. They're very hard to detect. The Chinese have built a significant number of new types of diesel submarines. They've also developed a significant number of new varieties of surface warships. Both of these sets of capabilities have application to the Taiwan situation. And the Chinese have deployed the submarines in some instances to areas well beyond Taiwan. They've deployed them around Guam, which is now becoming a area of increased US military presence in the Pacific. They've shown by doing this that they have the capability to deploy submarines into far deep water areas. And obviously this becomes a potential concern to any carrier battle group commander who wants to bring a carrier up close to Taiwan. We saw last October 26th, our carrier battle group, the Kitty Hawk, was in the uh, waters in the vicinity of Okinawa. And all of a sudden there emerged right in the middle of the carrier battle group, a very modern Chinese submarine. 
that nobody had seen, nobody had heard. Uh, it came up within a few miles of the Kitty Hawk itself. Uh, and we know that this submarine is equipped with very advanced torpedoes and that if it wanted to, it could have sunk our carrier. The Chinese know we are dependent on two things militarily in Asia. Number one, satellites. Number two, aircraft carriers. They have demonstrated to us they can take out each one. Will they ever do that? I doubt it. This is what you might call psychological warfare. Satellites are an American strong point. But if you look closely, they can also be a weak point. The U.S. relies on satellites to control their entire communications network, and that's a weakness. Today, and we were able to verify this during the last conflicts, the American military depends too much on its electronics and satellites. This dependence reminds me of the Greek legend. The powerful Achilles, who was invulnerable, except for his heel. And satellites are a little like the American Achilles heel. The 11th of September, 2006, the People's Liberation Army launched a missile that destroyed one of its own satellites. The explosion in space was obviously immediately detected by the Pentagon. There was consternation in Washington. Nobody had anticipated this Chinese initiative. The Chinese have had an anti-satellite program for some time now. And it's designed primarily to, um, de again, to deter the United States or to complicate U.S. decisions in the event of a crisis. So yes, I think the recent sh shot by the missiles, uh, by the missile to fire against their own satellite and shoot down their own satellite was designed to convey a signal to the United States about the fact that the Chinese are not simply going to sit back in their view and allow the U.S. to have predominant influence. They are going to try to influence the situation, in this case, in sort of an asymmetrical way by threatening what is regarded as one of the critical areas of U.S. surveillance. The Chinese army has also developed another system to blind American satellites. These are giant lasers that don't destroy them, but blind them enough to make them useless. This isn't science fiction, but a technology that is already in use. And then there exists a still more terrible weapon, a weapon that the Americans and the French have already mastered. Its development was a priority for the Chinese army. The Chinese have followed very closely the American um, dependence on the electromagnetic spectrum, the use of uh, communications and networking uh, among satellites and ships and command systems to, to fight a war. Uh, they saw what happened in the first Gulf War. They saw what happened in Kosovo. They watched Afghanistan. They watched the second Gulf War. And they realized that we are more and more dependent on the uh, electromagnetic magnetic spectrum and, and moving communications back and forth. And, and an electromagnetic pulse, which is produced uh, by detonating a nuclear weapon, usually fries transistors and stops that kind of communication. An electromagnetic impulse weapon uses a nuclear explosion to generate an electromagnetic wave. When this wave hits boats or planes, it instantaneously destroys all electronic equipment. No one dies, provided they are far enough away from the nuclear explosion. But the American battleships, totally dependent on electronics, would immediately be disabled. The Pentagon report described a nuclear detonated or nuclear generated EMP. I asked people in Pentagon, why don't you say they have conventional they generate the DMD. They say, we don't want them to know whether we know them. The conventionally generate EMP is less problematic and it is more useful or more usable because when you have this EMP, there will be no nuclear fallouts. There will be less international protests. They already have it. 
I, I yes, it, it is. It is like shooting down the satellite, getting the submarine under the aircraft carrier. EP3 incident off Hanan. It is. Look, we mean business. You pay attention to what we're doing. We're publishing the figures that our military budget is going up because we are creating a strong defense against you. China's developing power isn't only military. The regime has understood that it has to make use of every citizen, every business, every organization in its confrontation with the United States. An arms race wouldn't make sense against Washington. It's a war to control energy, the media, culture, and raw materials. And facing an America that overconsumes, that is deeply in debt, an America weakened by its own excesses, China counters with its best weapon, its breathtaking economic growth. The new threat isn't the classic military threat, direct confrontation between one country and another. Today it's no longer guns against guns, airplane against airplane or tank against tank. Confrontation takes many forms, in many different areas. For example, in finance or the media, there can be attacks in all these areas. The object of these new kinds of conflicts is the same as in a conventional military confrontation, forcing the enemy to accept certain conditions. It's still war, but war today goes beyond this military domain. It's what we call an unrestricted war. One has to learn to decode the battles in this new war. Sometimes they are small events that seem harmless at first. Thus, on February 27, 2007, the main American stock indexes plunged. Paris had just lost 3%. New York is in an uproar. The cause of this mini crash began with a tornado that originated on the other side of the world, in Shanghai. Suddenly, and with no apparent reason, the stock market there lost 9%, and it took the whole planet down with it. Nobody really understands what happened, but in New York, they pondered the lesson. China had just shown that it could use its new economic power to destabilize its adversaries. Above all, when they are weakened, like the United States, by the subprime crisis. Beijing uses economy in several ways. First, by influence. Well, in Southeast Asia, <laughs> worldwide. They invest money when the leaders visit that capital. Then they sign some agreements. The second is what you said. They would only hint at something they might do. For instance, the now 1.2 trillion US dollars foreign reserve of China as of the end of March 2007, 40% of them are deposited in United States Treasury bills. So if Beijing decides to transfer that to euros, it will be very painful to the United States. But Beijing doesn't need to say. It only hints here and there. And Washington feels a big headache. Thus, China and America multiply their battlefields. There is the piracy of Hollywood DVDs, the recall of Chinese toys by American builders, the reception of the Dalai Lama in Washington, the buying up of oil companies by Beijing, hundreds of conflicts. China and America think that they have to dominate in order to survive. The U.S. consumed over 35 percentage of the whole, how to say, global consumption, right? Eight times as their population percentage. Um, so they enjoy this position as the only superpower. Then they can get extra resources. So there is a bipartisan support stance for U.S. foreign policy. They will remain as the only world leader in the world. And then they will keep alert against any country, no matter the name of this country, China, French, uh, Russian, Germany, uh, Indian, Brazil, any country that can threaten the U.S. dominance, that will be a problem.
In Washington, China has become the major preoccupation of every administration. China is a competitor in the realms of economics, media and technology. World hegemony is no longer measured by the number of nuclear warheads. Congress has even created a permanent investigation commission, unique in its kind, whose mission is to study the economic and security challenges posed by China. Russia never got that kind of attention during the times of the Cold War. There is a global plan from China. Uh, they have two. Um, uh, one was uh, started in March uh, 1986 called the 863 program and one in uh, March 1997 called the 973 program. The, the first, the 863 program called the Torch Plan was a, a global plan designed to gather and bring to China dual-use technologies that could be used to improve China's technological base and economy and industry while improving its military capacity. And it's, it's an organized thing, you know. Each industry every year from the central government gets goals and targets and objectives and gets told to send people out and go do that. Uh, so it is organized, and, and it's not perfect, but it's organized. And the 973 plan uh, is a parallel designed to improve their capacity in basic research and innovation. People in the States pay too much attention to China. Uh, so there are some uh, oversensitive uh, on China. Then this oversensitive leads to a lot of, how to say, over-exaggerated uh, conclusion. So that's no good uh, to find the real fact. Um, I think uh, the real fact is that uh, the economic uh, power of China is still far ahead of, uh, far lack of uh, United States, not to mention military power. If the French Foreign Intelligence Collection Service goes to a student and says, while you're at Tufts University, we want you to go over to some laboratory and gather this, the student can say, I'm busy. It's going to interfere with my dissertation. If the Chinese Intelligence Service goes to a student and says, we want you to, you want a visa? You want a passport? When you go to the United States or to France, you will write a dissertation on this, you will work on this project, and you will report back to us, or you'll never get a job in China, or your family will lose its house. Now, they have the capacity to do that. The United States cannot maintain itself as a superpower if we allow our industrial um, production uh, to be uh, offshored, to be outsourced. Um, and that's what's happening now. We're finding a very large amounts of, of our basic in core industries. And I don't mean just like steel. Steel is one of them, copper, you know, basic, you know, uh, resources. But things like semiconductors. And when we find that our semiconductor industry has gone from 12, you know, state-of-the-art wafer fabs to three, um, because more and more are being built in Taiwan and Japan and, well, not in Japan, in, in South Korea. And in China, if we're allowing our, you know, uh, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, electronic science and technology research and development move to China, we, we can't survive as a superpower. This technological war culminates in cyberspace, 
China and the US have armies which are developing cyber soldiers who spy on or attack each other's computer networks. In March 2006, the US State Department decided to buy 16,000 computers from Lenovo, the Chinese company that had just bought out IBM. Some of these computers were meant for networks that circulate secret defense data. Larry Wurzel and his commission intervened to stop the delivery. Having been an intelligence officer for a lot of years, 25 years in military intelligence, um, and having also for a part of that time worked on counterintelligence and signals intelligence, communications intelligence, that um, I knew it was technically possible to alter or embed either software or even hardware into a computer that would uh, allow someone access to a whole network. The Bureau of Export Controls of the Department of Commerce was attacked and shut down by, turns out, hackers from China. The, um, the State Department itself lost a bureau and all its computers by hackers from China. The uh, National Defense University of the United States had its computer systems shut down, and the Naval War College had its computer systems shut down. Other computer systems, uh, government computer systems, have been attacked. And I think General Cartwright, the, the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, has recently testified in front of Congress about this. So, so I knew these things were going on. Um, and there's more going on uh, that uh, we learn about on the commission uh, because we do have access to classified information. Uh, I, I can only say that in many cases, uh, the United States knows these attacks are coming from China and knows that they're coming even from specific organizations in China. But I, I can't go into the details on who. Uh. The war on the Internet is as old as the Internet itself. And one can't say that this was a Chinese invention. In America, the CIA and NASA employ 25,000 people to work on the Internet. They have the largest Internet surveillance and listening centers. So it's true, war exists on the Internet. The war has begun without a single missile being fired, without the world noticing. The war has begun in all of these new technologies. Many civil technologies also have military applications. This is especially true of the entire electronics industry and the Internet. There are new battlefields in an unrestricted war. The media, finance, business, all these are included. It's a war because there is real antagonism. And both parties try to take advantage of their adversary. It's a new form of war, the unrestricted war. This unrestricted war has already begun. Almost everywhere in the world, there is a fight for oil, for water, for resources that are dwindling in the eyes of the West because of China's development. America uses its military might to assure its power and guarantee its vital supplies. China employs an asymmetrical strategy. It looks for its adversary's weak points. Nevertheless, this war is apparent everywhere in the world. In North Korea, Myanmar, Iran, or Darfur. In all the hotspots, China and America are opposing each other in the wings.
Remember the words of Ding Xiaoping, there cannot be two tigers on the same hill. <laughs>